Hello, everyone, and welcome back to uh, Mormon Stories Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. John DeLynn. It is January 8th, 2019, and we are in the middle of another one of our epic, touching, powerful uh, episodes on Mormon Stories Podcast, where we dive deep into uh, a Mormon family's faith journey or faith crisis or whatever you want to call it. Uh, we just spent a good four hours with Leah and Cody Young. Um, they talked about uh, growing up in the church, about each each coming from a, a family where there was divorce. Um, you know, Cody talked about his mission. They talked about marrying the temple. And they talked about many years of service in the church, Cody going to med school, Leah starting a business, and how that all culminated uh, in eventually a faith crisis that actually happened only 12 months ago, and what that was like for them to go through that um, and to be in a mixed faith marriage for uh, a number of years, or no, for, for a certain amount of time, a short amount of time before they were able to get on the same page. It was a very powerful um, several hours. Uh, many of you were uh, touched and, uh, and contributed, and we just appreciate that. Well, uh, now we're super excited to do something that we've never done before on Mormon Stories podcast. So uh, we, it's very common for us, or exclusively, we've kind of only had the adult perspectives on these faith crisis journeys. Uh, for the first time in my memory, what we're going to be doing now is bringing on um, a, a teenager. Um, Brinley is the oldest um, child in the young family. Uh, she's currently... 15, 15 years old. Mm -hmm. She was 14 years old um, when the faith crisis uh, began. And um, what we're really excited to do is just to bring Brindley on and have her share her perspective on what the church meant to her and then what she observed as her parents went through <coughs> um, their faith crisis, how she experienced it, and then how they journeyed together um, in that process to where they are now. And again, the Youngs have four children. Brindley's just the oldest of four. Uh, we'll go on to talk about how um, how all of the family has navigated uh, their their faith journeys with uh, believing family, friends, and coworkers. And uh, we'll end by talking about um, some interactions they've had with uh, a lead apologist for the church, as well as um, with with their bishop and stake president, as they. Uh, have started a support group for Mormons in Columbus, Ohio, and then we'll conclude with with how they uh, how they are now, how this lemon of a faith crisis, in some ways, has turned out, or in many ways, has turned out to be a huge gift of lemonade uh, for the whole family, and um, how they how they held on until they could see the light. So that's what we're doing. What do you guys think? Are you guys we're excited. ready? I'm excited. Yeah. Yeah. yeah? yeah. All right. Well, Brinley, welcome to Mormon Stories Podcast. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. The only other teen we've ever had on Mormon Stories is Savannah, and she didn't tell her faith crisis. She just talked about that moment where she bore her testimony in sacred meeting and then mm -hmm. about being gay and how the bishop or stake president or whoever shut off the mic. And so you are kind of the first teen to ever come on Mormon Stories podcast to talk about the faith crisis. Uh, how's that going? Uh, how do you feel about that? I'm excited. I've always, you know, I've, ever since I've gone through it, I've, I've, um, I've wanted to help people and, and f help teenagers feel like they have a voice and, and someone that's their age that um, can understand some unique perspectives that only, only children or teenagers get through through going this for through going through this, so <laughs> um, I'm excited to be here and and hopefully help people. Well, we're stoked to have you. And really quickly, you guys talked about this, Lee and Cody, before, but just for people who are going to be like, how could they dare let their their daughter be on a podcast? Blah blah blah. Why don't you guys share uh, for those who didn't catch the last episode why you felt like this is something you were okay with your child doing, in addition to her own wishes. Yeah. Um, well, something that we've really focused on um, since this has all happened, one of the very first things we did, which we'll talk about, is we we sat together and we, we talked about what our core values are and, um, you know, honesty and integrity and um, doing what we can to lift to lift where we stand. And Brinley came to us after finding out that we would be on the podcast feeling like 
her heart was guiding her to want to, you know, live that value of kindness and love and concern for others. And one way that she could do it and really reach people, especially young people who might be going through the most difficult experience of their lives, which it, it was for Brinley, is to choose courage, to choose courage over comfort and and to come on and to be on. And even though dad wasn't super excited about that decision for her, um, she felt very convicted. And maybe you can share what she said to you. Well, she shared, I, I just had some reservations in the beginning about um, wanting to protect her more than anything. Mm-hmm. And, um, but she, she feels a passion for helping people just like her mom. And so uh, she pled with me and with us to, uh, to let her come on and share her story and her feelings. And I thought, well, this process is about sharing our truth and sharing our experience. And so we ought to let Brinley, who's mature and able, uh, share, share her experience and her truth. Beautiful. I'm inspired. And um, I, I want to encourage everyone who's listening now, if they feel comfortable, whether you're listening live or later, if you share these episodes on Facebook or on Instagram or on Twitter or in email groups or wherever you have access, you can basically say something to the effect of, hey, there's this really powerful story of this family. And for the first time ever, we're hearing what it's like to go through a faith crisis from a teen's perspective. This wonderful talented, smart girl, Brinley, is, is sharing her perspective on a faith crisis. You share something like that on social media or an email or wherever, it just may, uh, number one, uh, attract people to listen who otherwise may not. But more importantly, you'll get the word out to anyone who's got teens who are going through this uh, that, that they should tune in because those teens will be able to hear from a peer um, and, and kind of feel like they're not so alone, feel like they're not broken, feel like they can have hope or, or learn lessons or, or have a mentor or get tools. So by sharing uh, this episode, you can actually do kind of, uh, in sense, a good deed, uh, a sort of missionary work about alleviating suffering, promoting healing and growth for people who are struggling. So I encourage you, if you're willing right now, to share this episode with whatever description you want, wherever you feel comfortable and that will help maximize the good that this episode can do. So without any further ado, Brinley, um, have you ever been on a podcast before? No, <laughs> not even close. No? Okay, no. tell us how old you are. I'm 15 and Okay, a half. 15 and a half. <laughs> Gotta add that in, getting my temps soon. <laughs> and um, so tell us just a little bit about your childhood and upbringing. Um, well, I was raised Mormon along with my three younger sisters. Um, and we were raised in a very literal believing home, you know, like, what are your earliest Mormon memories? I always remember primary, um, singing the songs and I remember getting baptized and that was really special for me. And, um, I, I have a lot of nostalgia about my, my childhood memories. They're all so, so special to me. So, and a lot of those were centered around the church and singing hymns with my parents. And I mean, we all still love the hymns and everything. And, um, but yeah, a lot of my childhood memories were uh, around the church and centered around the doctrine and family scripture reading, family prayers, all of that. So, so um, I, I, I don't, you didn't get to hear the very beginning, but I'm sure you know your parents' history. Both of them came from broken families where their parents got divorced at a young age. Mm -hmm. Part of their story was picking each other because they had confidence that the agreement that they had was that they would be devout in the church. And so in some senses, they didn't have the same upbringing that you have had. They, you've had an intact family. And then to what extent did you have an Orthodox family where, where, you know, family prayer and family scripture study and regular church attendance you know, was all totally part of the deal. To what extent? Yeah, was it pretty strict? Yeah, it was. It was pretty much every night. You know, every every, every night Sunday, what? every every night we read read our scriptures, the little kid kid picture scriptures, and um, said our prayers. And then Dad would kneel by us while we we said our personal prayers, and um, we would go to church every Sunday. We went to the. I mean, all the, when I got older, it was the young women's and the, and the service trips and 
homeless shelters and all of that and um, mutual <laughs> seminary for a while when I started high school. So yeah, we were pretty, I was always the one getting there early to get the extra point so I could miss every 10th day. <laughs> but um, I, yeah, I was, it was pretty um, strict, devout, yeah. <laughs> okay, devout's better than strict. Um, yeah, yeah. Did did you feel throughout your childhood and young uh, young adolescence, let's just say, did you feel like the gospel? What did the gospel give you? the the the, the Mormon gospel? I I want to I want to project upon you that it was a positive thing, that it was a healthy mm-hmm. good thing. So I'm not looking for dirt here. Right. What what? How did you feel growing up in this environment in, a, in an Orthodox Mormon environment? I I loved it. I mean, it was. Um it was everything. I went to school and I remember several experiences because you're taught so heavily missionary work and, and people need to hear the, the good news of the gospel. And so I was always the one um, asking people about their religions and I was always genuinely interested in their religions. I, I've always loved hearing um, about about what other people believe, but I was always the one after sharing, yeah, I'm, I'm Mormon and have you heard of the Book of Mormon? And, um, you know, just doing doing my part um, to be a missionary and do what I was taught and, and help people come to the gospel. Um, so yeah. (laughs) What were your favorite, uh, primary songs? I loved, I was actually just thinking about this a few days ago. I loved the song. Um, I like to look for rainbows. I like to look for rainbows whenever there's rain. I loved that one. It was, it was sung at my baptism. I also love a child's prayer. That's one of my, one of my favorites. Um, but yeah, I, I I love all the all the primary songs and um, have a lot of uh, good memories of sitting in primary and learning new ones. Or um, I've music has always really touched me. I'm a musical person, so and I think it touches everyone. But yeah, what about stories or heroes from your Christian slash Mormon upbringing? Were there any stories or heroes that really were important to you um, as you were growing up? Um, I, I think all of them were important to me. I didn't have like one favorite person, but I, all the Book of Mormon characters, it's like this story that, that you're kind of, you're brought up and these people are real. And so when I lost that, it was like, I lost these. So who is real to you before we talk about the loss? Okay. Um, all the Book of Mormon, Lehi, Nephi, um, layman I mean like all these all these characters in the Book of Mormon that I learned about um the what's the dude standing on the wall when the arrows yeah, and, Samuel the Lehman Samuel the Lehman yeah. yeah yeah that King and Benjamin. just all these faithful yeah um and, sons of Mosiah yeah the yeah younger, right? uh-huh, all of those people um were I had grown my whole life and they were just kind of like little comforts to me I guess and I realized how comforting they were once they were I figured out they weren't real, <laughs> uh-huh. but, um, that, yeah, that I, I loved family scripture. I mean, I loved it all. What did, what did the savior, what did, what did Jesus, uh, mean to you? Uh, and, and we'll, we'll talk about the loss of faith later. So right mm-hmm. now just okay. stay in the, the believing perspective. All right. What did Jesus mean to you? Um, Jesus, I think it, it he, he was like a a friend to me. <laughs> he was like a friend. Um, it's someone I never met, but just someone that I knew was always there for me. It was it was like my little friend in heaven. You know, he was always looking out for me and making sure that I met the right people at the right time. And and I knew my life was in it was in good hands and everything would work out. So it was this sense of of comfort that, um, and it kind of got me through the harder times in life, you know, like someone's looking out for me, someone, someone is there for me and, and he knows that what I'll need and I'll, I'll just get it and it, it'll be, uh, I'll be okay because I have this Jesus in heaven always looking out for me. So. And then what, well, how did you think about your relationship with your heavenly father and prayer and, and, and that sort of thing? I pretty much what my parents had taught me to do ever since I was younger. I prayed every night. Um, I 
I can't say I've had like any of those aha spiritual moments, but I just always felt this sense of companionship and um, that they were just, that these, you know, this Heavenly Father and Jesus and the Holy Ghost, they were like, like friends to me. I, I just always knew that I had them and, and um, that they were look, looking out for me. And it was, it was a sense of comfort and peace for me to be able to pray and know that they would, they were there listening and everything. Did you uh, enjoy going to church? Did you make friends there? Did you, how'd you feel about other families that you interacted with? What was the church experience like for you? I, I loved the church. <clears throat> yeah, I, I loved young women's, um, especially when I was younger and I had all the older kids um, there. I just, I loved young women's. In my journals, I was looking through some of my old journals and I could not wait every Sunday to go to Sunday, to go to church and, and see the girls and see the families and, um, sacrament meeting was never a big problem for me. I always liked listening to um, what everyone had to say. Um, I just, I loved the church experience. And of course, every so often I'd be like, oh, I don't want to go to church. But I, for the most part, I, I really just, I loved it. Okay. Um, all right. So um, let's see. What else? So, so far, uh, Leah and Cody, as you're hearing, if you're hearing her talk about this, do you want to add anything to kind of any perspective on what you're hearing and or anything that I'm leaving out so far? Yeah, I think everything that she said is accurate. Her um, favorite week of, the, of her entire life was girls camp. And I remember after her first year of girls camp, she came home and she created a calendar in her bedroom with how many? 300 uh, 108, 183. Oh, 183. It was half of the year. That's like it six was months. Half the year. So she had created a, a countdown. So she pulled one tab off every single day until her, I marked it off. Yeah. Yeah. Every filled day. Filled my closet. <laughs> and then she went to EFY and her EFY experience, she said, I didn't think anything would ever be better than girls camp. And I would tell her, you're EFY, because I went to EFY, and I loved it. And I'm like, you just wait. And she came home, and what'd you say? I I was, like, over the moon. I was in a kid's idea of heaven, of my idea of heaven, yeah. That was EFY 2017, yeah, the, my first time at EFY. Your first year at EFY. She just loved it. She just absolutely loved it, yeah. What about Father's Blessings? Did um, did you guys participate in that tradition? We did. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> we did um, every year at uh, the beginning of the school year. I gave. I offered each of the kids a chance to have a father's blessing, and every year they took me up on it. Um, and I think that was something really special that we shared. I know I I enjoyed it, and and so did they. Um, so yeah, and. Uh, we've been fairly healthy, so there haven't been a whole lot of <laughs> blessings for the sick provided, uh, but on occasion, but on not, occasion. not with frequency. It was we're grateful that we were pretty healthy. I think you actually gave me a father's blessing when you were going through all of this because I was really sick right before Christmas, mm -hmm. and I think you gave me that. I had never thought about that before. Actually, oh, really? I think that you were going through all this, and I asked for a father's yes. blessing. Yes, and he gave it to me, obviously. But yeah, uh. yeah, yeah. And what did, what did those uh, what did those blessings mean to you, Brinley? Um, did you do it before school each year? Yeah, before yeah. school, and it, you know the it w it was just I think the overarching it was just comfort for me, and like um, yeah, it was just it was peace and comfort, and it I, I it was a bonding moment for me and my dad, and um, a time where our whole family, you know grew closer together and we all sat and listened to each other's blessings and um I yeah I, I, it was a good start to my years I feel like in school I always felt armored or something I don't know <laughs> it was yeah it, it was I loved them as you thought about your family and your standards relative to other friends at school and other families that you would experience in the world did you have a sense of, 
you know, like we call it exceptionalism, but like, wow, Mormons are, our family's great and our church is great and we've got the true church. Like talk about what type of identity and place in the world your Mormonism afforded you as a, as a teenager. Yeah, I, I would say I definitely had that, that outlook of like, I've got it all, you know, all I need is to, to keep going and I'll, and I'll get there. I'll get to the highest degree of glory with all my family. And, you know, sometimes I remember looking at people and being like, if they only knew, if they only knew that they were just missing the true, the truth, and then they would be able to be with their family forever. And I was like, I've, I've got to teach all these people, you know, the truth because my family has it. Our church has it. And I would say there's definitely the, um, the exceptionalism there. <laughs> okay. And did that feel, how did that feel? Great. I yeah. loved it. <laughs> I loved it. I'm not feeling superior, but feeling like um, I, I didn't need anything else. I had, I had everything I needed, all the tools. Yeah, it, it feels nice to kind of know everything <laughs> and to have that level of certainty. Did you ever doubt? Did you ever question or doubt? No, I was... I was talking to my mom a few a few days ago, and really the only thing that I didn't agree with about the church was its stance on evolution. Um, because I had taken science classes. You like and science? Not really, but <laughs> <laughs> I took them. Um, but I the the evolution and the Earth and the space has always been really interesting to me. And before we actually went through this, I wanted to like be at NASA or something. I thought that'd be really cool. But, um, yeah, I, I just totally lost my train of thought. Evolution. 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 Um, so that's the only thing that I didn't agree with, you know, because the church says it didn't happen, you know, because it would contradict the Adam and Eve story. But I I had seen skulls from, you know, I, I believe the evolution because of all the science classes I had taken over the years. And so did you run that by your parents, or how did you deal with Not that? Not really. I It didn't actually bother me at all. It didn't raise a single eyebrow i was just it was maybe yeah it was a shelf item i guess um but were you aware that did you have an idea that the church maybe wasn't always in favor of evolution oh oh that wasn't in favor of evolution yeah yeah, yeah. where did you hear that um i don't i maybe in one of the sunday school just yeah i i just knew that the church didn't agree with it and i thought that was wrong <laughs> but you didn't talk to your parents about it necessarily. Mm -mm, okay, I don't remember. And I'm just curious, Cody. You you would have a science background as a as a you know as a doctor. Yeah. What did you have a position on evolution prior to your faith crisis? And if so, what was it? Um, it was a shelf item for me. Yeah, for a long time. Um, it clear. There's clearly there was evidence of it, um, and I couldn't negate that. Um, and it was one of those items that I just shelved okay yeah i just did and and so uh it would have been an uncomfortable conversation to have with brinley why actually. well because i wouldn't want to say anything other i wouldn't want to say put i wouldn't want to have a conversation with with her that might sow seeds of doubt in her heart about the church or its truth claims because i wanted her to be as committed as i wanted to be committed and so um so yeah, that would have been a difficult conversation to have. Now, now that you hear her say she didn't want to, you know, didn't mention it to you or didn't bring it up yeah. and was kind of having this doubt and question and didn't necessarily feel interested or the need or safe or whatever it was to share with you, how does that make you feel now? Oh, I get it. I have no hard feelings. I know I can understand why she would not want to bring it up. Yeah. Um, and, you know... Uh, I wish that we had created an environment where there was more open conversation about, hey, what is there anything that's difficult for you about your faith or your religion? But it, you know, maybe we were just too afraid to know. Like, is there something that the kids are struggling with? We just, I, I don't know. But we didn't ever have those types of open and frank conversations about uh, difficult things in church or religion. Do you want to add something, Leah? I don't think it's it's that we were afraid. It was just that there was one plan, and it was the right plan, and it was the true plan. And I think that's why for Brinley there's a disconnect. It's like it's called confirmation bias. <laughs> it's help. It's helpful to learn about this when you're going through learning new things. There's something called confirmation bias, and that means that things don't fit within your paradigm, within your religiosity, within your dogma. Um, you sort of it, it's almost like it doesn't 
go in. It's almost like it's like, okay, I learned about that and that's their idea, but it's dismissed because it doesn't confirm what you believe. It doesn't confirm your deep rooted beliefs. And so you don't, it's, it's like hard to describe it, you know, now we can see that looking back, but at the time it's like, well, of course I didn't bring it up. It was just, you know, I, it's like you, you can't explain it, but it doesn't matter. Yeah. Sure. Because the church is true. Yeah. Right, right, right. So that, Brindley, so that in, that, in some sense you did, you were very similar to your parents in that neither of them up until late thirties even consider the possibility that the church wasn't true. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like that's kind of where you were. Yeah. 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 That, was, that was where I was at. Okay. All right. Um, and uh, how did, what was the harmony like, like between your siblings and, and, you know, just kind of like, what's it like to be one of four sisters growing up Mormon? Um, like within the Mormon context of religion? Yeah. Or just like in general? I mean, it was... Me and Avery always um, were closer in age, so there was a time where we, we fought a lot. But I, we just, I've always loved my siblings a lot and, and try my best to get along with them. And the whole families can be together forever. I was like, well, shoot, if I'm going to be with them forever, I better <laughs> learn how to get along with them. And, you know, I, but yeah, I, I love all of them. And I would say we get along fairly, fairly well. And were you, you know, was a goal of yours, I think you've already said this, was to return to the celestial kingdom with all your mm -hmm, family and mm -hmm. have your family be together forever? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was, that was my goal. Okay. <laughs> and was there any degree to which um, you were like, oh, this is too strict or, oh, this is too intense or, oh, this is all too heavy, you know, um, all the rules and all the standards, pressure... Mm -hmm. Or were you just really kind of into it? I was I was pretty much into it. I remember sometimes with the modesty, they were like, for you know, for girls, it can be a little bit above the knee. And I guess it varies, you know, depending on who you hear it from. But I was always like, every girl, you know, they don't want to wear, <laughs> I didn't want to wear knee-length shorts. But, um, you know, I didn't want to wear skimpy ones, but just ones that looked a little more flattering. And But really, it was never, I never really... You know, because it was the plan. It was a true church. So if God said so, obviously, he would expect me to live up to it. And I shouldn't complain or moan or grudge about it. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, this is a question for uh, for Leah and Cody. As you guys had sort of the idea of the model Mormon child that you wanted, if you had that. How, and this is a tough question, but how... How was Brindley living up to your hopes and expectations as parents? Before from, we went through this? Yeah, Never heard from this. like a gospel church perspective. <laughs> yeah, she was um, all in. I, I did not know how else to say it. She, were you guys proud of her? We were totally proud of her. I mean, we were just so happy that she loved girls camp. She loved DFY. She was going to go to BYU. Um she was, you know, a straight A student in seminary and we were so proud of her for her, you know, cause she had to get up really early for that. And I wouldn't get up with her. She'd get up on her own, make her own lunch. Um, she would always sign up baptisms for the dead. She loved that. She loved, cause she loves helping people. She loved going, feeling like she was helping people get to heaven. And she, um, I mean, she was your model Mormon child. I think sometimes she was difficult, hard on herself. I could see that as she got older, that um, kind of that perfectionism in the faith, I think that it teaches a bit, um, became hard for her because of her personality of wanting to always do her very best all the time. So I think there was some pressure there. There were a few tearful conversations, but for the most part, she was fantastic i mean yeah yeah i think you know we were always very proud of her and very grateful that she as the oldest was setting this good lds faithful example in her home for us an example to us as well but most most importantly a, an example to her sisters um and we're still super proud of her and, and grateful for her example to this day. But at that time, you know, in the church, we were, 
uh, certainly that was that I, I felt a good sense of relief that okay, the oldest is on the path. Like the three will follow, because they're, they're going to want to follow their older sister. And so I felt some real comfort from that. All right. So, so Brindley, let's, let's now dig in to kind of when things started to fray a little bit. Do you have any memories of the very beginnings of when things started to not go so well? For, for, your mom has shared with us when she started uh, working uh, for Ronan and Fields, is that how you say it? Rodan and Fields. Um, Rodan yeah. and Fields, yeah. And she started to work a little bit more. How she was struggling, not just to juggle it all. She was still doing it all, but starting to feel a little bit frustrated at the double standard between what her dad, you know, what your dad was able to do as a doctor, but what she wasn't allowed to do as mm-hmm. a as a working Mormon mom. Did you have any awareness of all of that? Yeah, um, we. I do remember sometimes my mom would get, you know, frustrated because dad was always gone. And I, I would get frustrated too, because my dad was always at meetings. And, um, of course that didn't have anything to do with me doubting the church at all, but, um, it was always a little sad for me. (laughs) What, What were some of your thoughts and feelings when your dad was serving in church when he wasn't at the job, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, it was busy. He was really busy. Um, and I, I felt protective over my time with him because he's working so much and we're at school and I, I really, you know, Sunday and Saturday really, and sometimes he's working on Saturday. So Sunday was like my day with him and our, our day with him, um, except for family dinners and bedtime. So, um, when, he was, he was like working for the young men's all the time. Sometimes it would make me frustrated and, you know, he would always go on camping trips. And I remember my, my mom was frustrated and I heard some of that where he would go on camping trips, trips with young men, but he'd never taken us camping. And that made my mom upset and, you know, just, just sad that we hadn't gone camping with our dad. (laughs) Sounds kind of funny, but yeah, it was, um, he was spending an increasing amount of time with the young, the young men and wow, that's great. Um, I wanted him home too. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. So how did that, how did that progress? Uh, how did things get, how did you start? When did you first get a sense that there were cracks, not just stresses around him being gone a lot, but cracks that were related to faith in the church and maybe mm-hmm. your mom's the beginnings of your mom's faith journey. Do you remember sensing that something was yeah. up? And what'd you sense? Yeah, they, well, I remember on occasions, my mom would just come out of her room sobbing. And I remember I had walked down one, one night kind of late to get a drink of water. And I heard them sobbing in their room. And I was, it was just a lot like my, my parents would get upset sometimes, but this was like not, not normal. Um, and I remember them walking, my mom walking out one day and I was like, something's wrong. Like, I thought it was a divorce. I thought like something's really wrong here. Um, and they either want to wait to tell me or they don't know how to tell me or, but something's really wrong. Um, and I, I don't know about it. And, um, as sometimes I'd ask my mom what's wrong and she was like, Oh, I'm fine. It'll be fine. And, and that kind of comes like it kind of confirmed that something wasn't fine oh, no. for, me. for me. I was like, this is, this is really not. And there was one eve, Christmas Eve, she just got really upset at me for, for something that I had done, which was wrong that I had, I had spoken um, disrespectfully to her, but it was, it, it didn't merit that kind of blow up. And so it really made me nervous. Um, yeah. It, so that was the beginnings where I, where I started to, to see that things were wrong. So, uh, so how did it progress? Um, <laughs> well, it's how long Christmas, did that continue? I, I would say I started noticing about like around the Christmas season, December, 2017, a year ago, to, last Christmas. Yeah. 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 yeah 2017. Um, so I started noticing it and then it, it progressed and Christmas came and went and, um, and then later, 
later in January, should I tell the email? Okay. Mm -hmm. So I, I had, my pants were gone. My siblings were downstairs in the basement watching a movie. So it was just me upstairs and I had opened my dad's computer just to search something up. And it was open to his, um, to his email reel with, with my mom. And I was like, that's weird that they're emailing. We live in the same house. Um, and they were emailing back and forth. Uh huh. Uh huh. Now, now Lee and Cody, what were you guys emailing about when you <laughs> shared the same bed? <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it was difficult because we were in that phase that we were talking about but previously where it was like, what are we going to do? You know, and, and we don't have little ones. When we had little ones, you can talk when little ones go to bed and you can, you know, but we, we have big kids. And so it's very challenging to have completely private conversations. Um, even sometimes when we think the kids are up in bed and they might be down here and they can hear us. And so... We really wanted to be very careful to keep the information away from them, to keep it as safe as possible so that we could plan, plot it out perfectly. <laughs> we wanted a perfect plan because that's how we work. We have a perfect plan <laughs> and that's just how we do life. And so we were <laughs> plotting our perfect plan. Um, but, you know, during those conversations, um, we, we didn't want them to hear anything. So we did use sort of email communication. You and Cody. Yeah, Cody and I. Mm -hmm. It would be things like, what are we going to... Um, things like, what are we going to do? But also just like, here's where I'm at, you know, because still at this point, Cody had never once said, I don't believe that the church is true, right? I mean, he is neck deep in all of it every day, all day. But it was so difficult to admit for him, I think. Maybe, I mean... Well, there was a sense that I think for me, there was a sense that I'm the last, I'm the last pillar standing, in a sense. And I don't mean that offensively, but just like if I, if I come to the conclusion that the church isn't what it claims to be and what I've believed it to be to this point, <clears throat> then we're all in the boat heading out of the church, and. There, I didn't want to do that until I was sure. I didn't want to get in that boat head away with doubts about the uh, the, the path we were headed on. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Because I knew at this point, Leah had told me, I don't believe the church is true anymore. And this is where I'm at. We had the new marriage proposal where we agreed that, you know, that like she read beautifully, we were going to found our marriage on on principles apart from the church and truthfulness of the church. And so, yeah, there was a real reluctance, not, not so much consciously, but subconsciously, to share where I was at, what I was thinking, to talk out loud, to express those emotions and, and my thought processes out loud, because I wanted to be very sure and very convinced of what I was doing because of the gravity of the situation. I'll also say that, that sometimes it's a good tactic for even a married couple to exchange emails because w remember we talked about the timeouts last episode when, when things are so emotional and so triggering, um, they can get really volatile really fast and you can say things that you can't take back. You can, you can have really unproductive conversations where you're both living in your limbic system, your, your lizard brain, your fight or flight brain, and you're just adding insult to injury and fighting mm -hmm. an email because it's asynchronous it just gives you the chance to like you be thoughtful you write down something carefully you make sure you edit it you make sure it's got the right tone then when you send it they can read it in their own time in their own pace uh, they can absorb it you know and 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 then allow themselves to react and have whatever emotional reaction they have but it's not all real time where everybody's having to deal with the excessive cognitive and emotional load of managing affect in addition to trying to have an intelligent conversation, <laughs> right? Yeah, and, and we, we knew with the girls having access to the home computers, uh, we were trying to be ultra careful. I said, here, Leah, don't, don't email me to my main account. Email my junk account with anything <laughs> pertaining to, to, the, to this topic. Um, problem was... <laughs> There was one email that had been sent to my my main email account, and I forgot to to I forgot to move it to the to the junk email account, and so um, and it was for whatever reason it was open or I don't know. Yeah, how. I didn't I didn't go searching for it. Yeah, so it was open. And <laughs> it was open. So late in 
middle to late January, Leah and I are out on a date, and we're uh, the next morning, early at like six in the morning, we're leaving on a cruise. Leah and I, with with her her work, she had uh, qualified to go on a cruise, a week long cruise with her work. We were excited. This is going to be my first cruise, and we're out running some last minute errands. And it's probably it was dark, so it was probably eight or nine at night, and uh, and we're out on our date running errands, getting ready for the cruise. And you get a phone call. <laughs> And we get a phone call. All right, Brinley, so, so Brinley, take us to when you stumbled on the email. Okay, so what did it say? I, I, I can't remember everything that it said. I did read a paragraph or two, but I was so rattled. And I got to the sentence that my dad had sent my mom, something about her decision to leave the church. And I shut the computer, and I, like, freaked out. Um like didn't even know what to do. I was running around the house. The girls came upstairs. They're like, what's wrong? And I'm like, I can't talk. Go back downstairs. Go watch your movie. And like my heart was pumping. I was all sweaty. And it was, I couldn't think straight. And I called my aunt. Um, who Kelty? Yeah. Yeah. Who left the church a while ago. And I, I can't remember what I, what I said, but I was like, what's happening? Do you know about this? Tell, what's wrong? Tell me. Because I was like, this is what they've been upset about. And everything was, was clicking for me. And it, it was really, um, it was scary. It was, I still remember how I felt. It was, yeah, it was What were you was afraid scary. of? Um, I, w- I was still in that Mormon, Mormon paradigm, that, that mindset of, of I'm going to lose my, my eternal family. My mom's bringing us to hell. Um, or at least she's, she's going to go to hell and, and the rest of us, you know, we're not going to be an eternal family and uh, temple and everything was just like rapid fire in my brain. I was thinking of all these things. Um, and so then I, then I called my parents and well, we got a call and Brindley was absolutely incoherent. She was sobbing. She was screaming. Um, she had called her young women's leader. Oh my God! Before us, <laughs> I think I texted her. I, well, her either way, I leader was in the car on the way to our home, <laughs> and we were across town. And Cody. I <laughs> well, I mean, what do you what do you say in that moment, right? I mean, here we were listening to podcasts and trying to just put together this this nice plan of how we're going to have a beautiful discussion with our, well, a difficult but beautiful discussion with our kids about nuance and belief and learning new things. And then you get this just slap in the face phone, not, you know, it came as a slap in the face. So sudden, like, okay, here we go. You've got 15 minutes to drive home and, uh, uh, you're going to have that conversation right away, whether you're, whether you're ready or not. And you got to call the young women's leader and tell her thanks, but no thanks. Everything's fine. Um, <laughs> we'll, we'll be home. I appreciate your love, but you don't need to come over. So. Yeah, what were you going to say, Cody? What, Leah? What were you going to say? It was just really intense. I mean, she's crying and she's screaming. And, I Co- screamed, and I'm like, yeah. <gasps> and Cody's like, Brindley, Brindley, calm down. Me. Calm down. The kids are crying downstairs. They think someone has died. Um, <laughs> You know, because Brindley was babysitting, and and I'm just thinking, okay, we can't go on this trip. We got to cancel the trip. We got to, you know, and I'm trying to think through this, and we're trying to race home, and we're trying to have Kelty intercept the young women's leader and Cody. I mean, it was just, <laughs> it was just crazy. And then we walk in, and Brindley just, uh, it was it was so heartbreaking. You know, she just pushed me away and. She's like, get away, get away, get away. What were you thinking and feeling, Brindley? <sighs> um, I was thinking that my mom was sitting on all of our accounts and um, that we were going to go to hell. And, and I mean... You were mad at her. Yeah, or I was mad at her or... and... I mean, didn't know at all where she was coming from. All I did was read that one sentence, and that was enough for me to draw my own conclusions. And, um, yeah. Hmm. Were you going to say something, Cody? Oh, well, um, yeah, it was was very intense um, emotionally for us, you know, for all three of us. And um, Brindley was shaking and... 
She just kept repeating over and over. Well, you took her into the room. She we took her into our bedroom, and she kept saying to me, Dad, um, just tell me it's true. Dad, just tell me the church is true. Dad, just tell me it's true. Tell me it's true, Dad. It's got to be true. Just tell me it's true. And... Um, well, at that point, I had come back in. You'd come back in, and... Um, and for the first time, I vocalized that, that I didn't know if it was true. I had to say to her, Brindley, um, you know, I said, listen, we've been learning some things, and it's been really, really hard. You've probably noticed that something is wrong. Um, but I can't tell you that I know that it's true. I can't say that. I know I taught you that for 14 years. Um, and I've said it for many more years than that, but I, I, I'm at the point where... I can't, I just, I need to be honest tonight, I can't say that I know that it's true. Um, and so that was, that was, I think, important, an important step for all of us. Um, but it was, it was hard. Yeah, we, she was, um, she was just shaking. Like her body was just convulsing and it was just this, and we were all there hugging when he had said that, and he had never said that before. So we're all there, and we're all hugging, and we're just, we're all just sobbing, you know. And I just thought, this is so wrong. This is so wrong to be put in this situation. This is so unfair. And I thought that so many times over the course of, you know, this is just our first child. This is just the first moment, and I just thought this is so wrong, you know, that my child is shaking in our arms and my husband's weeping and I'm, and I just felt like my heart just breaking for her. And she was just, yeah, you can share how you felt. Yeah, I was, I remember that it was, we probably talked for three hours in, in my parents' room and um, it was, probably the hardest like if I could pinpoint a single moment in my life like a five minute period that was the hardest it was when he told me that he didn't know if it was true and then the the world pretty much came crashing down um and I didn't know what to think and growing up in a religion where you think you know everything and and you're in this little comfort box um and then stepping out of it in a matter of like an hour and then just knowing nothing and everything's gone it's scary to say the least <laughs> and they they told me a bit uh, they they told me about the kinderhook plates and they told me just about a few of the issues uh, we talked about joseph smith and moroni a bit um but they only told me a few baseline what do they? What do you remember about the Kinderhook plates? I'm just curious. Um, I remember that it it was a plot to catch Joseph Smith, um, and so they had buried these ancient records, which weren't really ancient records. Um, and then they they and then Joseph or some someone dug them up and brought them to Joseph, or or Joseph had them, and um, he translated them, but it it wasn't a language to translate, and that for it was me was all made up. But yeah. He, he thought that the plates were authentic mm -hmm. and that the characters were some ancient language, even though they were made up. And so he translates it as if it's real. Right, yeah. And, and comes up with an interpretation mm -hmm. when it was all designed to fool him. Mm -hmm. Right. And yeah, I, th I think that for me was like finding out Santa wasn't real on a much bigger level. Like when that childhood ma magic just is gone um and i mean he's the basis and we we know he's the basis of our religion and i i know that when when they're telling me this and i was like if it was like a spiral if he if he didn't if he thought he translated them but he didn't that means the book of mormon that he translated there's a very good chance it's not true which means that the foundation of our religion and it just kept going and i connected the dots pretty fast and I was like oh oh my gosh like I felt like everything that I I had ever learned and lived up to was gone in like a, a moment 
So how did that how did that discussion that night conclude? Yeah, so it was a long talk. I think we just talked at very, very high level about a couple of things. Cody's like, um, you know, she was 14 at the time. And so we're like, Joseph Smith had a wife that was your Close age. 33. You know, <laughs> um, just a couple, just a couple of kind of like, you know, we, we hadn't planned on doing it this way. So we were shooting from the hip and we were mostly trying to just comfort her and love her and reassure her and, you know, and she really wanted, is it true or is it not? Is it this or is it, you know, and we were kind of like, you know, Brinley, we're just learning a few new things that we didn't know. And well, are we Mormon? Are we not? Are we, we're just learning a few new things that we didn't know. And we're just, we're going to be here together as a family. We're going to work through this as a family. Well, what, well, are we going to go to church? We're not making any decisions now, <laughs> Brinley. We're just learning a few new things. So she very much wanted to understand well, I does- just wanted it to be done. Like the second <laughs> I remember I, I cried in my bed that night for hours. Um, really? Yeah. After, after like the conversation was done, I just like, I, I didn't know what to think. And I, you know, and that's normally when I say my bedtime prayers, which brought more tears. And I was like, I don't know. Cause I didn't know anything. I wasn't even close to the process of figuring out what I now believe. I was just in like a nothing's there anymore kind of mindset. Um, so what was I going to say? So anyway, Co- Cody said, you know, we <laughs> went through the night and, you know, we'll get on to kind of how we talk to the kids and kind of your process from there. Um, but it was a traumatic night. And I think that Brinley felt very confused, obviously, as any child would. And it was, it was, it was painful and uncomfortable. And, and Daddy, we were like, we, we do not need to go on this trip. We will stay home. And Cody's like, I will, at, at least I will stay home. And Brinley insisted, no, go, go. I'm going to be fine. And so Kelty, we ended up going. We briefed the gal who stays with them. We briefed her on everything that was going on. And then my sister was sort of that emotional support and talked to Kelty, I think, every day that week. And it was just, the trip was just it was miserable. It was just horrible to be, we shouldn't have gone. Um, it was, it was horrible to be away from our daughter that knew. And then we said, you can't tell the other kids yet. Cause we need to talk when we get home. And that was really hard for her to have that on her without the other kids. So it's a lot to put on a kid. It's a lot. And it was a really painful time to be away. I'll just say, and, and I always hate to disrupt the flow of the narrative, and sometimes I, I feel just I want to give a coaching moment, and uh, and many listeners have said they like this little feature, so if you hate it, tell me. But, you know, whether it's an infidelity, sort of feelings you have as a, as a married person for another person outside the marriage, or, you know, uh, addictions or substance use or a faith crisis, whatever it is, we tend to not want to harm our loved ones by having that tough conversation. And so we think, well, I don't want to hurt them, so I'm not going to tell them. And then we start inching down this road of some sort of decision where if we had just brought them in early and incorporated them and had open, frank discussions at the right time, at the right place, in the right tone, we could sort of titrate, I think is a medical term, the the dosage of of the medicine or the or the substance so that it could be absorbed in this normal healthy reasonable time frame but when we hold something back and i don't fault you guys as parents for doing that it makes perfect sense because you were trying to figure out which way is up but i just think we forget sometimes that we th- by by withholding information from loved ones we think that we're saving them pain and suffering and doing them a huge favor when in reality sometimes you can compound and multiply the pain and the suffering because then when they find out, they not only have to deal, and it's usually not when you introduce it, they have to not only deal with the earth shattering news and that it's grown bigger than it ever was when it first started, but then they have to deal also with the added burden of feeling betrayed or misled um, or like they weren't trusted or they weren't let in and they were kept out of the information. And it's a lot to bear. And so I just, it's, it, I'm not saying go run out and 
wreck your life by making really shocking reveals right now. <laughs> but I'm just saying, as you're trying to counterbalance and think about how you negotiate this and other sorts of things, um, you can really save your loved ones a lot of pain and suffering by just slowly letting them in in an appropriate time and way and tone instead of allowing this huge shock to happen all at once. Which wasn't our plan. <laughs> right. And then when we did talk to the other, I mean, our plan was actually to, I agree with what you say, our plan was actually to do what we did with the other girls, and, and we can share that. But we had a great plan. It just <laughs> didn't work. Brindley saw an email, and it changed the trajectory of <laughs> yeah, her yeah. finding out. So, yeah, life is yeah. what happens when you're busy making plans. <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. Yeah. So then we got back, and um, we sat down with the other children right when we got back. Do you want to share how, what we did there? Sure. This was where the perfectly executed plan actually happened, according to plans. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So, um, so we sat down with Brinley and the other three, and um, we basically just said, "Hey, listen, uh, Mom and Dad have learned some some new things. It's been really hard." Um, and, I was already crying by that point. <laughs> and, um, it's been really hard, and and it's it's helped us to understand some things about the church that we had never known in our life, and and it's caused us to look at the church differently and think about the church differently, and. Um, and we tried to keep it again limited in gender. We've got you know a six-year-old and an eight-year-old and a an eleven-year-old uh, that we're speaking to. So we 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 didn't come to any final de uh, decisions again. It wasn't like we're not going to church anymore, and it wasn't that uh, uh, burn the whole thing down. But it was just you know we're in the process of learning and it's hard. But uh, we want to be honest. There are some things that are really hard and um, parts about the church that that have caused us to question, uh, seriously question, um, and to try and begin to open open the door a bit to some of that conversation, which for the six-year-old, she's just like... She went up and played with the dollies like halfway through. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Can, I, can I go up and play? Sure, go up and play. Um, but for the older kids, it was a little more meaningful. There were some questions. They asked questions, you know, well, what do you mean? What kind of information are you talking about? So we tried to, again, very high level, Oh, well, for example, there are some things about Joseph Smith and the way um, he practiced the religion and the way, you know, he was married to some other women. And gosh, we didn't understand much about all this. And and so that's caused us to rethink, you know, how we feel about him and whether God would ask him to be a prophet and that sort of thing. Um, and so, you know, it was uh, a little more, it was much more controlled and thought out Um but still, for me at that point, I'm still in the process of, I mean, we, we still haven't had the conversation where I sit down and say, I don't think the church is true. Um, yeah, you have Well, I said, said, I don't, I don't know. know if it's true. Yeah, I can't, yeah, I can't yeah. tell you that it's true. Yeah, yeah. But, um, so I'm still in that process of wanting to make sure, wanting to continue learning and learning and learning so that I can have no doubts and mm -hmm. be sure. Yeah. Cody really wanted to, to get to that place, and I wanted him to be able to get to that place as well. But something that we really did that was really helpful is I think that when people learn these things and they have kids, they sort of, you know, there is some real anger and there is some real betrayal. And something that we were counseled to do by you and by, um, through the Mormon's Transitions podcast, is to just um, differentiate and say, you know, you know, we're all different people and this is all going to feel different. And, you know, moving forward, some of the conversations we had were like, well, moving forward, you know, in the beginning it was like, yeah, we were all still going to church. But then it was like, you know, there might be times where um, it really got into this digging deep into having emotional safety in the home. And, you know, some days Avery might want to to go to church and, and, you know, just really supporting whatever anyone wanted. That was such an important thing to us is we're not telling you these things to make any decisions because if you want to continue going, you know, it was very much, we're going to honor everybody's path. And even that felt really different and uncomfortable. And that caused emotions and tears. <laughs>